And this is how they get your guns, my friends. It's going to be, uh, <laughs> for those who can see, as clear as most crystal clear day there is. I'm going to share with you here. We're going to start with the uh, the politically incorrect guy of the Civil War by H.W. Uh, Crocker III, Phil Sheridan's Maxim of War. The only good Confederate is a impoverished Confederate. I know you're thinking a dead one. No, an impoverished one. Death is popularly considered to be the maximum of punishment in war, but it is not. Reduction to poverty brings prayers for peace more surely and more quickly than does the destruction of human life. Interesting. Reduction to poverty brings the prayers for peace more surely and quickly than does the destruction of human life. So we're going to go into this uh, book that I've read, and I highly su suggest you read it too. Savage Continent, Continent, Europe in the Aftermath of World War II. And I'll put a link in the show notes because this is, uh, you're going to see this, and we're going to go into ersatz of the Confederacy a little bit. We're going to show you some uh, primary sources as well. One of the few things that united Europe during the war was the ubiquitous presence of hunger. International trade and foodstuffs had faltered almost as soon as war broke out and ceased altogether when various military blockades began to take hold around the continent. The first foods to disappear were imported fruits, all right? So hang tight, so you see that. And foodstuffs, the uh, international trade and foodstuffs had faltered almost as soon as the war broke out. So let's... Being an agricultural and not an event of people, we were often sorely tried for the want of the most insignificant articles. The trouble with us was that we had always depended on the North for everything, from a hairpin to a toothpick, and from a cradle to a coffin, and thus suddenly cut off from our source of supplies with our ports blockaded was not a pleasant situation. Interesting. Nearly all the smaller towns and vill villages in the Confederacy that were not within the federal line of march were filled with refugees from the beleaguered towns and cities. This was especially the case in South Carolina. Every inch of space was occupied. Many of the first families of the state lived in discarded baggage cars along the lines of the railroad. It was not an unfrequent thing to hear the sound of a harp, a piano, or a guitar from their, these homely abodes which were fitted up with all the elegance that refined taste that their refined taste could dictate. However, they had no food. Our coffee was made of various substitutes such as rye, wheat, rice, potatoes, peas, and peanuts. Interesting. Tea was a decoction of blackberry and sassafras leaves. Think of it, ye devotees of the five o'clock teas. Your favorite be beverage was made of blackberry leaves sweetened with sour gum or molasses. Article is written in the 1895 issue of the Confederate Veteran, Veteran by a uh, lady named Miss Felix G. De Fontaine, Old Confederate Days and the Confederate Veteran, 1896. She was the husband of Mr. Felix De Fontaine, who was a uh, well-known journalist. Ironically enough, we see a, a, a time where Miss De Fontaine was attending a large party of capitalists. And it looks like in New York City, 20 years uh, after the Civil War broke out, uh, was finished. Anyway, starvation, but right here, we're going to go back to scarcity in the ersatz in the Confederacy. Star because of the scarcity of food and drink, refreshments at a social gatherings were very simple. Starvation, party, starvation parties were popular during the war. These were simple affairs where good fellowship and water were the only thing to be had. Occasionally, all would contribute money so they could get a fiddler. Uh, of all the shortages on the Confederate home front, that of food was the most pressing. It was a daily problem, and when solved for one day, there was no assurance it would be solved for the next. That, mean, that meant that housewives had to be on the next, on the constant lookout for new foods to prepare and new ways to prepare them. So let's keep reading here, because this, uh, this is where it's going to get kind of ugly and actually frightening. So let's go into this book again. This is bad. Into it. So the uh, the first foods to disappear in the World War II were the imported foods, uh, fruits in particular. Uh, on the continent, one of the shortages that made itself immediately felt was coffee. Exactly same thing in here in the South. Literally, man. I, I, 
which became so scarce the population was forced to drink a variety of substitutes made from chicory, dandelion root, lion, uh, dandelion roots, and acorns, just like in the South during the 1865. Other more serious shortages soon followed. Sugar was one of the first things to become scarce, as well as perishable goods like milk, cream, eggs, and fresh meat. But neither were the neutral countries immune to shortages. In Spain, for example, even staple foods such as potatoes and olive oil were highly rationed, and the huge drop in imported goods forced the people of Switzerland to make do with 28% fewer calories in 1944 than they had before the war. Traditional meats such as lamb, pork, and beef became so scarce that people began rearing rabbits in their backyards and allotments as a substitute. Substitute effect, we talked about economics. The struggle to stave off famine was every bit as important as the military struggle and was taken just as seriously. Which exactly is the same thing we, uh, Miss Massey talks about in this book right here. The struggle to stave off famine. The first country to topple was Greece in the winter of 1941 and 42, uh, just six months after being invaded by the Axis truth, troops, more than 100,000 people starved to death. Farmers began to hoard their foodstuffs, inflation spiraled out of control, and unemployment soared. There was a major, near complete breakdown of law and order. Of the 410,000 Greek deaths that occurred during the whole of the war, probably 250,000 were due to starvation and related problems. So hang in there, it's going to get worse. Potatoes and bread were severely rationed throughout the war, and the people were forced to supplement their diets with sugar beets and even tulip bulbs, which is so ironic because the, the tulip, <laughs> the great tulip, uh, well, the great tulip uh, uh, mania, when Contract prices for some bulbs of the recently introduced and fashionable tulip reached extraordinarily high levels, then dramatically crashed, and yet they were eating tulips uh, 400 years later. Literally 400 years later? Hmm. 300 years later? It's crazy. Journalists entering Amsterdam described the city as a vast concentration camp displaying horrors comparable to those of Belsen and Buchenwald. Huh. Oh, no, not Holland. Yeah. And by 1944, the situation was desperate. Reports coming from inside Holland warned of impending disaster. There are knocks on every door, wrote one German housewife. New ration cards are to last for five weeks instead of four, and no one knows if they'll be issued at all. We count out potatoes every day, five small ones each, and bread is becoming scarce. We are growing thinner and thinner, colder and colder, and more and more ravenous. By the end of the war, the official daily food ration in occupied Holland had dropped to just 400 calories, which is half the amount received by the inmates at the, uh, the concentration camps. In Rotterdam, the food ran out altogether. By the 19, end of 1942, some amongst the Nazi hierarchy were pressing for the physical annihilation of the entire population, not only Jews, but Poles and Ukrainians as well. The main weapon was hunger. Hunger. The proposed genocide, which was to dwarf the Holocaust, and the scale of his ambition was to be hunger. Any surplus food gathered was to be sent home to Germany. Kiev, Kharkov, and some other places in the meantime were left to starve. In the form formulation of the plan, army officials openly talked between 20 and 30 million deaths through famine. One might expect the food situation in Europe to ease once the war was over, but in many places it got worse. In the months immediately following the Declaration of Peace, the Allies struggled desperately and unsuccessfully to feed Europe's starving millions. The problem was not only was there a worldwide shortage of food, but also that food was there could not be distributed properly. After six years of war, Europe's transportation infrastructure was shattered. Just as crucially, law and order had to be restored as well. In some parts of Europe, Europe, in some parts of Europe, food supplies were looted almost as immediately as they arrived. Ray Hunting was an officer with the British Army Signals Unit when he arrived and liberated Italy in autumn of 1944. He was used to seeing beggars in the street, but then he saw even worse. It's a cruel error to throw foodstuffs indiscriminately into the midst of hungry people. They turn instantly into a mass of struggling bodies fighting for the falling gifts. Men, brutish in determination, punched and kicked each other to gain possession of the tins. Women w tore food from each other's mouths to push into the hands of children who were in peril of being trampled underfoot. 
Then another officer went up to this guy and said, what a waste, chucking all that food away. Don't you know that you could have had the best looking women down there for just a couple of those tins? Did you hear what I'm saying? This officer said, you could have had the best looking woman in Germany, in Italy, I should say, for just a couple of those tins. Starvation was the most difficult and urgent problem in the aftermath of World War II. Hang tight, because it's going to get ugly. Oh, how history repeats itself. Going back to this, there was a shortage of fresh fruits, vegetables, and condiments in many parts of the Confederacy. Even in sections where fruits and vegetables were plentiful, the distance to the needy areas, the poor transportation facilities, the... Uh, and the lack of refrigeration prevented proper distribution. Right, let's keep going. So you might have the foods in Europe, in the South. You can't get to it because of the lack of distribution. Supply chains, shall we say? Logistics. It's hard to believe that some of those shiny little tins of meat and sardines, meat paste, could start a riot in a camp. That bags of Lipton tea and tins of, of Barrington House coffee uh, could drive men insane with desire. But this is so. This is as much a part of the destruction of Europe as those gaunt ruins of Frankfurt. Only this is the ruin of the human soul and is a thousand times more painful to see. Uh, it's going to get worse. Watch. Moral destruction. At the beginning of October 1943, shortly after the liberation of Naples, Norman Lewis of the British Field Security Section found himself driving to the square somewhere in the outskirts of the city. Dominating the square was a large, semi-destroyed public building with several army trucks parked in front. One of these trucks appeared to be full of American supplies and crowds of Allied soldiers were helping themselves out to tens of rations. These soldiers were then streaming into the municipal building, clutching the tins before them. Curious to find out what was mm, curious to find out what was going on, Lewis and his fellow soldiers followed them inside and made their way to the front of the crowd, where they recorded what he found. Here, a row of ladies sat at intervals of about a yard with their backs to the wall. These women were dressed in their street clothes and had the ordinary, well-washed, respectable shopping and gossiping faces of working-class housewives. By the side of each woman stood a small pile of tins, and it soon became clear that it was possible to make love to any one of them in this very public place by adding another tin to the pile. The woman kept absolutely still. They said nothing, and their faces were as empty as expression as graven images. They might have been selling fish, except this place lacked the excitement of a fish market. There was no soliciting, no suggestion, no enticement, not even the most discreetest and most accidental display of flesh. The boldest of the soldiers had pushed themselves tins in hand to the front, but now, faced with these matter-of-fact family providers driven here by empty larders, they seemed to flag. Once again, reality had betrayed the dream. The air fell limp. This was some of the sheep. There was some sheepish laughter, jokes that fell flat, and a visible tendency to slip quietly away. One soldier, a little tipsy and egged on constantly, finally put down his tin of rations at a woman's side. He unbuttoned himself and lowered himself on him, on her. A perfunctuary, a perfunctuary jogging of the haunches began and came quickly to an end. A moment later, he was on his feet and buttoned up again. It had been something to get over as soon as possible. He might have been submitting to a field punishment rather than to an act of love. What makes this story so interesting is not so much the obviously desperate plight of the Italian housewives, but the descriptions of the soldiers' reaction. On the one hand, they can't believe their luck. A truck full of supplies and the power over them was unlimited. On the other hand, the reality of the situation leaves the majority of them profoundly uneasy. There is an understanding that to take part in this transaction is degrading, not only to the women, but to themselves as well. It's also significant at no point is there even a hint of empathy among the housewives. They are merely objects, as intimate as a graven image, as he said. According to Lewis, such behavior became increasingly common in southern Italy's liberation. He records being visited by an Italian prince who wanted to know if his sister might be allowed to work in an army brothel. When Lewis explained that the British Army did not have any official brothels, the prince and his sister left disappointed. 
On another occasion, when invest investigating the serious sexual assault of a young Italian girl, her father tried to press a traumatized girl's favor upon him. All he expected was a turn was a good square meal for his daughter. Desperation was like, like this was no, by no means confined to Naples or to Italy. A whole generation of young women in Germany learned to think it quite normal to sleep with an allied soldier in return for a bar of chocolate. In the Dutch town of Herlene, U.S. rifleman Roscoe Blunt was approached by a young girl who, matter of fact, asked if I wanted to ficken or just cousin. It took me a few minutes for my brain to click in gear and realize she was asking. When he asked her age, he told him she was 12. In Hungary, there are scores of girls as young as 13 admitted to the hospital for VD. In Greece, as young as 10. Such degradation affected the, the Daily's Express war correspondent, Alan Moorhead, far more than the physical devastation he had seen. When he arrived in Naples in the immediate aftermath of his liberation, he wrote despairingly, despairingly about how he had seen men, women, and children beating each other as they scrambled for handfuls of sweets thrown to them by the arriving soldiers. He had seen pimps and black marketeers offering free, uh, offering fake brandy and child prostitutes as young as 10 and boys as 6 selling obscene postcards, their sisters' favors, even themselves. In the whole list of sordid human vices, none, I think, were overlooked in Naples during the first few months. What we were witnessing was a moral collapse of a people. They had no pride, no dignity. The animal struggle for existence governed everything. Food. That was the only thing that mattered. Food for the children, food for yourself, food at the cost of any abasement and depravity. And after a little, and after food, a little warmth and shelter. What Moorhead, Moorhead recognized was that food was no longer just a physical issue, but a moral one. Across Europe, millions of starving people were willing to sacrifice all moral values for the sake of their next meal. Indeed, years of scarcity had changed the very nature of food. For many of Europe's women after the war, there was no longer anything unusual about having to sell one's body for food. It was left to those coming from outside continental Europe to express surprise at the wreckage they were witnessing. Secondly, it is obvious that for the majority, sexual morality took a backseat when it came to matters of survival. Even a perceived threat to one's survival seemed enough to justify the abandonment of virtue. All right. So I, I think you get it. When you're starving, you'll give up everything. Everything for a meal. Everything. And that's how they're going to do it. I'm not sure they're going to do it with an evading army, frankly. But scarcity, I mean, look, man. You think my neighbors over there, when they get starving and they know I got some food hit down here, they're not going to freaking come after me to get my kid, uh, to, to feed their own kids? <laughs> you crazy? How about when I run out of food? What am I going to do? You think I say, oh, no, I'm, I'm holding on my AR-15. This is how they're going to do This is how they'll do it. This is how they freaking made the South. So the South became like the North when basically... The North essentially starved the South to death, and the South capitulated. I, you know, well, I'm, I'm not judging at all. It just is what it is. The Northern Industrialist, which started the whole thing that we're in now, took over the South. Oh, lo and behold, World War I came and went. Huh, almost, almost by chance, <laughs> because a Sarajevo assassination took place. Uh-uh. That was the, the continuation of the globalist cabal, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, you name it. And it's not anti-Semitic to say that's freaking stupid. Rothschild was not it was not a Jew, he is Baptist if memory serves. And now we go into World War II. <laughs> what happened after World War II? Well the EU ultimately came to be. And you can't vote for the EU president. It's crazy, right? Now we got one world government. Slowly but surely, the pendulum is just taken over, taken over, taken over, taken over. I, I Look, I don't know if Russia is part of this or not. I don't know. I think, I, every day I think something different, actually. Is this part of the grand scheme of things? It's hard to see it is, though, frankly, because it seems like NATO is falling apart. But then I start saying it's not really. It's adding Switzerland, Sweden, Finland. It's like expanding. But I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, 
you can see it. So now the uh, the Europe has been dominated by the EU, the European Commission, which isn't European sovereign. It's not. Where is the prize? The prize is always on the US of A. It's going to be hard to have invading hordes here. So how do you do it instead? Well, we're starting to witness it now, aren't we? Green New Deal. Lockdowns because of freaking uh, uh, flu-like symptoms. And that's not discounting. The, I look, I had the flu-like sick, the symptom. It sucked. Probably the second worst flu I ever had. But even Fauci said that at the beginning of it. There's going to be a, a bad flu-like uh, virus running around. That's what he called it. That's what he said in the journal, what well, New England Journal of Medicine. In February 2020, Fauci had penned an article saying that, severe like flu. And now what's coming to, I don't know. Supply chains, high gas prices, it's, it's they're going to starve you to surrender is what they're going to do. i love to hear your thoughts, man. Scary stuff. And there's really nothing you can do. I mean, you can prepare the best you can. I'll share with you some ideas. But uh, I'll say that for another time. See ya.